Business over drinks. Business over drinks. This is Dave and Tom. This is business over drinks. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Business Over Drinks. My name is Tang and I'm calling in from Singapore. Hello, 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 Governor. My name is David. I'm calling in from Brizzy, Australia. How you doing? I want we have to... a special guest tonight. I want to apologize what are you gonna for Dave's terrible. Gonna... Okay, cool. Sorry, Dave. Carry on, man. <laughs> it just yeah. freaks people out every time we do stuff always like apologize. that. It, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was a very smooth introduction. We have a very special guest today. Um, his name is Ryan Chu. So Ryan Chu is a Forbes 30 under 30 Asia 2020 honoree, and he's a co-founder of Tribe, Singapore's first government-supported platform driving neutrality, collaboration, and growth of the blockchain ecosystem. Tribe works closely with Enterprise Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Temasek, Citibank, IBM, and Intel, and others to grow the blockchain ecosystem in Singapore and beyond. Since its inception, Tribe has accelerated more than 50 blockchain startups with a combined value of more than $1 billion, so not that much. The idea for Tribe actually came out of a meal at his favorite Prata shop on Jalan Besar in Singapore with his business partner, Ng Yi Ming, when they decided to create a global blockchain ecosystem with the aim of connecting blockchain startups with corporations, governments, and investors. Before that, though, Ryan's entrepreneurship journey started at the age of 19, fresh out of national service where he spent his meager $3,000 savings to develop a gaming application. He had so much more savings than I did, man. Ryan join us, joins us tonight or today, this morning, whenever you're listening to this, to talk about his life as an entrepreneur, the future of blockchain and NFTs, as well as some handy tips on where to get the best Prata in Singapore. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Hi everybody! Well, uh, th- thanks for having me. You know, yeah, thank, uh, thanks for joining I'm us, sure Ryan. If... Appreciate it. Thanks, David. And thanks. I Tom. have. I used to work in Singapore, and uh, I didn't have much money, and I have many memories with towing without having much money. I'm not sure if you were there, but Prata was my go-to <laughs> meal. Like, I had two dollars fifty, and I remember there's a woman. This was an orchard. There was a woman with a drinks cart. Mm-hmm. And she was offering lychee drink. I was so thirsty. I said, oh, how much is it? She said, $3. And I said, sorry, I couldn't afford it. All I could afford was, was Prata. Um, so you mentioned earlier before the show, you can actually make Prata. Is that, is that a thing? Um, well, um, I think in one of my previous lives, uh, I was working at a startup that focuses a lot on like um, um, workshops and classes, right? It's almost like a marketplace for this kind of um unique talent uh, to learn this kind of stuff um, so I was invited to one of the classes that taught people how to flip prata and 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 here's a fun fact right uh, you don't the prata doesn't actually flip right you don't actually flip it right it, it's just it, it's kind of on the same side it's just you know um, getting bigger every single time you flip <laughs> yeah it's, it's look back. <laughs> for, for anyone who doesn't know can you guys explain what, what prata is it's right dough I think yeah yeah, I think of it's it like, as like a, a South South Asian fried bread sort of thing. So it's like a doughy yeah. bread thing that you. It's great for eating with curries and like. Um, it's just an amazing food. It's a staple. It's a staple for people. <laughs> it's basically like white bread for people in the U.S. That's how I see it. Um, <laughs> actually, before we jump into the into the the real meat of things and kind of get all the questions, um, maybe you can just quickly find out what people are drinking. Uh, Dave, what about you? What are you drinking? I'm drinking for the first time in my entire life, 0% Merlot. There's 0% alcohol Merlot, which was generously given to us by um, Giesen from New Zealand. And it's 0% Merlot, and I just had a try, and it is very, very interesting. It's actually pretty good. I can just down it without feeling guilty. And according to this fact sheet, it's 70% lower in calories, then a regular 12.5% alcohol wine at just 18 calories per 100 milliliter glass. And it, it's it's uh, it's interesting. I like it. Oh, nice, man. And uh, there's no good. guilt when I it's wake good up that, the next It's morning. good that it's lesser calories because then you stop being a fatty. Uh, Ryan, what about yourself, man? <laughs> what, are you, what are you drinking? <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. I'm super boring. I'm drinking coffee, actually, at this hour uh, simply because I, I, I 
have I think a couple of meetings um through the night, so you gotta stay awake. <laughs> No worries. I also have a couple of meetings coming up as well. So I'm just drinking a beer versus a gin, which is what I would normally do. <laughs> so um, apparently Carlsberg, which I don't drink normally, uh, launched a mm. Pilsner. So I'm trying the Carlsberg Pilsner. I'm not a massive beer person, but it's all right. As far as Pilsner goes, it kind of tastes really? like a normal Pils- Pilsner. Also, they're not sponsoring huh. this at all. So uh, I don't like Carlsberg. <laughs> it's cool. They should. I can say that. <laughs> they definitely should. <laughs> I, can, I can say that because they're not sponsoring it. <laughs> if they were, then I love Carlsberg, but uh, it's different. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, so awesome. So we'll put links to everything in our show notes so people can actually figure out whether they want to drink it or not after after the listening to this episode. All right, Dave, do you want to take the first question? Maybe maybe skip the Prata question? <laughs> We're just going to ask Ryan a bunch to. of questions about Prata. I don't want Prata. to talk about Prata. <laughs> I just want to spend 15 minutes talking about Prata because it's so yummy. But this stuff we're going to talk about is really interesting stuff, especially the NFT space. But before we get into NFTs, I just wanted to ask, you know, can you tell us more about yourself and your background in life as an entrepreneur? I'm, I'm a fellow gamer too, by the way. I'm not sure if you still play games. Um, occasionally. Um, well, I think I started, uh, started my entrepreneurial journey, I think, um, close to more than 10 years ago. Um, so I started off building applications. I, th- I think the first ever app that I built uh, was was a game. Um, not sure if you have heard of this game called Soul Charades. Uh, no. All right. No, okay. I'm not familiar um, with that game. Okay. Why, why so did you tell us what it was like? Game, yeah. So so this particular game is almost like um, uh, Ellen De- DeGeneres' uh, hit up. So it's a charades game that that um um that you place on your forehead and someone has to guess, uh, you have to guess, um, you know, based on, based on how the person is acting, acting it out. So I thought that that game was very Americanized. So I wanted to localize it, uh, create, you know, um, uh, allow people to, to have your, your friends appear, you know, as the list of uh, characters that you have to become and record them. And then you send them to your friends. I thought that would be pretty funny. I will use it myself. Um, that didn't turn out too well. So uh, I actually emptied out my savings from from the army um, to do that, and um, uh, subsequently gained a lot of experience. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's uh, that's the, <laughs> yeah. well, the experience when, of when failure. Yeah, I think Tony is very familiar. That means I I I lost a lot of money. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's screwed up. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I I think that was young. I was young and uh, um, um, overly excited, right? So. But that I think um, taught me a lot of that. I really did learn a lot um, from the experience, and I went on to mm-hmm. um, start a couple more other startups, of which one of them, um, which is a game, um, was was um, uh, uh, purchased by 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 another company, and um, subsequently started uh, one with my army mate, my friends, um, uh, Fixer. Uh, then went mm-hmm. on to run a San Francisco-based startup. Um, by becoming, I think, the lead for APAC. And subsequently, I think we, then we moved on to that truck. Yeah. So Be- before, yeah. sorry, I thought I'd interrupt both of you guys. I'm just curious, though, once you, once you gained a lot of experience and lost all of your money, <laughs> did you, did, did your family, did you just decide to, to get a job just to get some income or was it like no. all or nothing? I'm just going to live on water and oh, cereal. And- I love that question. Thank you so much. Uh, well, my family didn't know. I didn't. I didn't have the the, the balls to, to tell them. <laughs> yeah. So I had to make do. Um. So what happened was I became a waiter. Um. The reason why I became a waiter was because I think when you empty out your bank account, you kind of have no more money to eat. Uh, and I didn't want my parents to know, right? So I became a waiter. And you know, on 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 average, I think in Singapore, cash flow doesn't come so fast, right? Like you 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 get paid at the end of the month, but I still mm-hmm. have to eat for that month. So becoming a waiter allows me to, you know, get the, the free food uh, from the restaurant itself. So that's that's kind of what I did, uh, just to get by, just to get by for that uh, one or two months, right? Um, then, yeah, and that was in the middle of uh, studying, yeah, in school. Oh, so studying, being a waiter, and then you started your next startup soon after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well. No, so I mean, that to me is kind of like what. Uh, the your entrepreneurial journey should kind of be like because i think making mistakes early on gives you the 
gives you the strength to kind of carry on and that's how successful entrepreneurs are, are born because if you if you if you may have a modest success at the start right you kind of don't know what failure yeah. is like and if you don't know what failure is like you yeah. can't deal with it when bigger failure comes your way so i think i mean uh, yeah. based on your life now i'm assuming you don't you're not really looking back and thinking that was my greatest failure in life you're just thinking oh that was a great learning experience oh for sure for sure i think uh, all, all yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. I think all of these shaped um, who I am right now and how I react to things and how I think things uh, think things through, right? So I'm, I'm super grateful for that experience. And I think I'm also very lucky to be in a position where I can experience that without, uh, you know, very massive um, problems, right? Uh, apart from having to wait tables. That's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I, I've got a follow-up question on that because I think, right, when you when you kind of started all your businesses, right? Um, like, what was some of the what was some of the mistakes that you made with your with your first one? And then, like, you know, mm-hmm. as you kept on getting better, the next iteration got better. You 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 fig- you fixed those mistakes and you moved on, right? What were some of the initial mistakes that you think, uh, at least in your experience, you think is kind of the most common ones that first time entrepreneurs or those like those are younger younger people kind of starting something would make? Wow, um, that that. There's so many. I I I kind of need to think this through. Uh, well, the the one of the earliest mistake that I made was not not having a clear enough vision and not having a clear enough um 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 end end product, right? So what mm. happens with that? And I think that happens to a lot of uh, first time entrepreneurs as well. Um, it's you you get like you get overly excited and you bloat your product so so much so that it can never get to market, right? So I think that is one of the, the key things that I learned. Um, like, for example, every time you think of a new feature, you go to your engineering team and say, can you add this? Can you add this? And then you delay your launch timeline by a month, two months, three months, and the cost just keeps going up. And you don't even know if the market likes your product. You're just thinking, oh, this is cool. I want to have this. I want to have this. So I think one of the most important lessons I've learned is like, um, uh, I think this is also a very common lesson, right? Like, um, you have to define what your MVP looks like, the minimum mm-hmm. viable product, right? That you can be happy, that solves a particular problem that that you set out to solve um, and, and go to market with it, right? It doesn't have to straight away, you know, gain that kind of massive traction. I mean, it doesn't work that way, right? You go out there, you, 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 you solve the problem for maybe 20, 30, 50 people, right? Get their feedback, iterate, and then you, 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 um, you know, you yeah, add, on, yeah. add on to it. So I think that that is one of the key um, lessons that I've learned uh, over the years. Yeah. That's kind of like the approach that Turing and I had to this podcast. I mean, when we started, yeah. we didn't even have any equipment. We were just we were both speaking into one computer. That was embarrassing. And we were, we were that really, was really, 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 really. We were really drunk. And and uh, but then now was 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 still obviously there's still a lot to get improved, a lot to get better. But we're just a million times better than when we started. But we just thought. Get something out there, learn the lessons, and keep improving. Yeah. Um, but tell us about Tribe and how you came about to starting it. All right, right. Um, so I think Tribe started about uh, sometime in 2018. Um, that was where there was a massive, um, you know, a cryptocurrency boom. There was uh-huh. a lot of hype uh, around ICOs back then. Um, oh, yeah. Along with the hype came a lot of skepticism, a lot of scams, a lot of like. Um, in, in, in the industry called them rug pools right like um, so basically there was a lot also a lot of mistrust right on on what you know uh, cryptocurrency and therefore um, blockchain can bring to the table so we we started off at least uh, me and my partner Iming, right we started off uh, um, with the vision to shine the light on the blockchain technology itself and what it can bring to the table to further the you know uh, further innovation um, and I think at that point, uh, like you, it's quite early in the in, in relatively early, I would say it's not super early, but like relatively early uh, for the, for most people. Um, and the governments was just started to to take a look at it, like uh, paying more attention to what exactly is this like technology. Corporates were paying attention to it, but all of them because of the massive um, information asymmetry between um, the the people in the blockchain space as well as uh, and, and the people in, in the more corporate space or in the government, right? Um, there was a need for like kind of a bridge, right? And we wanted to serve uh, and be that bridge. Uh, so we 
you know, spoke to Enterprise Singapore and told them that, hey, you know, um, we can dive, deep dive into the technology itself, look for startups that leverages on that particular technology to solve real world problems and, um, you know, um, help everyone understand, hey, this is the, this is, this, this technology, what it can bring to the table, right? Beyond cryptocurrency, right? Uh, like, yeah. And that was what we set out to do. And um, today, I think we are running our fifth batch. Yeah, so we're quite lucky with that. Um, so as we were running the accelerator program, um, and as we were functioning as that kind of bridge, right, uh, we managed to gain, you know, uh, and, and, and gain some interest in, in, in that space itself. Um, and realize that there are other you know, gaps, right? For example, uh, corporates and startups, they want to leverage on blockchain technology to build something, right? They have this particular use case and, and you know, it was a uh, it was pretty decent use case they want to build. Um, but one of the, the biggest problem in the market is then who's going to build it, right? Like, uh, because yeah. we are having a lot of um, talent crunch at, at, the, at, the, at the moment, right? And, and um, not a lot of engineers are very familiar with, how to utilize blockchain technology so to solve that problem i, I think we see it in two folds um, number one is you know developing a pipeline of talent right number two is also talent uh, allocation right you don't want to have like a congregation of you know, uh, too, too many people working on solving one particular problem right because you're already resource strapped so a location is as a, you know as important as building up a, a, a bigger pipeline for more people to be educated. So we started multiple other um, you know, initiatives like um, Tribe Academy that focuses on training um, and, and, and a recruitment firm, a recruitment front, right? To, to help with the placement of the, the talents that we have trained. And um, since then we have gone on to to, to work on um, other programs like hackathons and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's kind of where we are today. Sorry, sorry for the long answer to your question. Nice. No, no, that's that's a really good thing. It's good to understand as well, because I think what you're doing is you took what was basically an accelerator program and kind of try to cover the uh, maybe not holistic, but you try and cover the whole uh, as as many problems as possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Because these are problems that we found no solution to, so that's why we decided to work on them ourselves as well. Yeah, just just to contribute back to to helping to build the ecosystem. Could you explain like, how I'm guessing? Because even today, how, how how are people adopting or even acknowledging blockchain technology? Is it was it a hard sell to go to to go to the government and go to to other corporations and say we can help you with with your blockchain challenges? Like just to explain what blockchain is to the layperson, was was it was it an uphill climb doing all of that? Well, I mean, it depends on how you explain it, right? Um, if we start off by explaining the technical the technicalities of what blockchain is, right? I think uh, most people fall asleep before we get to the point where they can understand um, the technology itself. So what we uh, focus a lot on is use cases. So when we bring about like, uh, and th- th- that was also kind of why uh, we wanted to focus on you know, um, innovation around the blockchain space by working with startups because they bring the use cases, right? Uh, that can be immediately understood by many people. Um, and when we talk to the corporates, we just explain the use case to them and explain how you know um, blockchain facilitates this particular use case. Then, yeah, they, they pretty much caught it quite quickly. Awesome. Yeah. Are you able to kind of like maybe just give us a little bit more uh, insight and information on like what are the real world applications for the for the uh, for the tech? Because I I think like like you said right, there's a ton of Maybe maybe there's a lack of understanding around because when people when people think blockchain they immediately think crypto, and blockchain is yeah, uh, yeah. as everyone is, seems to say is bigger than that, right? Crypto is an aspect yeah. is uses blockchain that they, yeah. it is not the same. I mean, the crypto currencies are an application of the technology, right? Uh, block or, or that, that, that you know we come to know as blockchain. Um, there is one particular use case that would. I would like to highlight uh, that is, um, you know, in recent years, um, makes it very easy to, for people to understand. Um, so that is the uh, record of your um, uh, digital health passport. So one of the startups that we work with actually allows you to submit your digital health um, record on the blockchain and, and, and more specifically, you know, your vaccination status um, on the blockchain itself, right? And And how and why this, makes a lot of sense is because uh, 
I don't know if you've been traveling around this region uh, recently, right? Like if you go to different region uh, regions, right, there are certain um, certificates that are not recognized or, you know, uh, for some reason um, in, in one place vis-a-vis another place, right? So if it's on the, you know, it's, it's on the blockchain itself, um, immigrations can easily verify whether this particular certification is authentic or not, right? That eases a lot of... Uh, um, Headaches you, that you have to print your 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 search. You have to get it notarized. Some sometimes you have to ensure its authenticity. You need to somehow prove its provenance. I I I, I do. You know, I mean, all this just had, adds to the already you know painful experience that you have to travel. Not 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 but most recently, but you know, uh, maybe a few months or a few yeah, a couple of months ago, where the restrictions of for traveling right. still um quite tight, right? So yeah. so how, how will you carry that? Let's say I have my vaccination status via blockchain. How will I, how is that presented and carried around through an app? Through yeah, it can be through an else? app. It can be through an app with the, the hash, right? And if you, if you verify the hash, you can see it on, on, on any, you know, blockchain scanner perhaps. And would that technology be more efficient than a QR code, for example, or, or a, me- a chip that you put in a passport that has your medical information? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's just, diff- it's, this is different technology to try to solve a problem, right? Like technologies are enablers, right? Uh, to solve a particular problem, you can you can couple them together. In fact, right? If you put a chip on a passport and that particular chip is, you know, rec- it's verified on on the blockchain, that works as well. Yeah. So so you see, this is just a technology, right? How you use it, I think that's more important, right? You can you can you can choose to use a chip, right? Um, but I don't know, chips can be fake, maybe I don't know. Um, you could lose it, yeah. But blockchain is more. Like, what would the advantage of, of blockchain mm-hmm. be over using a, a chip? Because it's, or, I, I think, blockchain is accessible all over the world without there needing to be any sort of yes. uh, physical. Yeah. It's a unique. It allows you for unique identifiers, which is kind of what the NFTs are built on, right? The unique identifiers. Yes, it's correct. authentication. Yes, in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean that's really interesting. Okay, also, think- Ryan, you're you're really polite. You could just said Dave's question was really stupid. It'll be fine. We say that all the time. <laughs> we say that all the time. Uh, no, I think no. they, they yeah because I, the the thing is you you shouldn't see them as uh as competitive technologies right they can work together essentially right you could you you could have a chip that that um that when scanned verifies against the blockchain to know that this particular chip in fact is authentic right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, that that's absolutely right. So yeah, you're right. I think it's use of technology that matters here um, and how people mm-hmm. are doing it. And I think maybe that's where the confusion lies because when everyone thinks of it as a, as a specific type of it, it's, they think of it as a technology similar to a chip, you know, it's just a chip. You have it there, it, it's what you use and then that's it. Versus blockchain is more mm-hmm. of a platform in which you build things on top of as well. It's uh, it's underlying technology in a lot of ways. Exactly. Yeah. No, that, that's really interesting. And I, I think this kind of also helps us um, transition a bit into NFTs, which everyone's really interested in. I'm really interested in. Um, uh, we, we can go into the nitty, we can go into like the, 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 the specifics of what NFTs are in a second. But I kind of want to understand, right? Um, do you deal with a lot of people, especially from the government or, or, or the corporate side, asking you about NFTs? How do you, how do you explain to people that it's not a scam? Well, uh, and uh, I, I keep going back to this, uh, uh, but but NFT means uh, non fungible tokens, right? Mm-hmm. So effectively, it's 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 the technology yeah. that enables you to generate a non fungible token. So that in itself cannot be a, a, a scam, right? Like uh, because it's it's just technology. Um, what might be constituted as a scam is if you uh, sell it for what is not, right? Mm-hmm. Um, for example, uh. uh like I promise that if you buy this particular NFT, you have access to a Discord channel, right? What mm-hmm. constitutes a scam is that if the Discord channel doesn't exist or eventually isn't built out, right? So you are not delivering what you promise. But if it's overpriced, then perhaps it might even be in a bubble, but this is not really a scam, right? Yeah. And if the promise is nothing more than this is just a JPEG, buy it if you like it. And, and people choose to buy it for some reason and jack up the price. I, I mean... It's willing buyer, willing seller situation. Could, could we st- take a step back a little bit? And for the like, for the average person out there, could you explain what what an F- NFT is? Right. So 
Uh, for the average person out there, okay, so do I, I can compare it to uh, what you would know as a, a typical token, right? So a typical token is a fungible token. So one Bitcoin is equal to another Bitcoin. There is no fundamentally no difference, right? The value of one Bitcoin, Bitcoin yeah. A and Bitcoin B is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas for NFT, uh, NFT A and NFT B has different, they have unique properties, right? That are, you know, unique identifiers that make them different. So they are non-fungible in a sense that one is not the same as the other. I hope that <laughs> that 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 that, uh, that explains. And you can use them for for many many different use cases, right? And that's why um, people use them for. I I see two main groups. There might be more, but I I see two main groups. Number one is um, people usually create or use NFT the technology to create passes. So passes enables you access to something, right? Uh, they might enable you you access to an experience. It's almost like a ticket, right? And you can sell it, right? And I think that's the whole point as well, um, that you actually do own it. You can resell it on the, on the market if you if you find that you don't no longer need the access to the particular thing. The access can be to a Discord group, a social group. It can be to anything. So access, right, mm-hmm. is one. And another class or type of NFT would be like the digital assets, Part. so that will come in the form of art right like your jpegs right um so uh, and and the value of the jpeg arguably you know it's, it's it depends on the market right if people choose to believe that that the price is this and people are willing to pay for the price uh or to own this particular jpeg yeah then you know willing buyer willing seller right okay right? um and there are other types of assets like in-game assets like that you if, if they are uh for some some somehow i mean those games utilizes assets that are that are nfts that have been recorded on the blockchain then you actually own the assets and and eventually hopefully once a standard has been formed this asset can become portable from one game to another i think that is very valuable right uh, because pe- as you know you know people are paying a lot of money for avatars on games anyway right so like these are just some of the use cases of NFTs and, and, and why the unique properties of each NFT is is um it's it's so, usable in, in this case. So one thing that I was actually really looking at NFTs as a, a great use case would be, for example, if you want to kind of circumvent the the ticketing platforms, you know, like in the US it's it's Ticketmaster and I and I forget the rest of them, but then you have uh, Live Nation and a few others across. Wouldn't it couldn't NFTs be used as a way to, for example, uh, authenticate and create a ticketing system, as you mentioned, like a basically passes or anything there, a ticketing system to live as well as virtual events? Um, you can, you you can, but I think you have to understand okay so so why would you want to do that right i think that's the first question if you have a valid business um opportunity for it to be an nft because printing tickets is is not going to it's definitely always going to be cheaper than having an entire uh, team minting you know nfts and, and and selling it right so um do you want to go through that hassle or uh, is there a business um, reason Right, or why it should be an NFT, and if, if there is, then you know, depending on your, your your appetite for for risk and investment, you can invest in making all your tickets and NFTs. I think that's fine, right? Yeah, but all the physical ticket works as well. So again, you're you're using technology to solve a problem, right? But mm-hmm. do you need to use that kind of technology to to solve this particular problem? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that that, 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 tickets, that that killed my idea pretty hard. Brilliant. Oh no no! I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm the joking, problem right. that you're trying to solve, yeah. But you know, it, it could potentially solve a counterfeiting, uh, uh, fake tickets mm-hmm. problem, right? Uh, because it's almost uh, impossible you have a finite uh, NFT, right? Uh, that is yep. verified against uh, this particular blockchain from this particular provenance, yep. minted yep. at this particular date. Yeah, you can't fake that. Yeah. So yeah, the counterfeiting problem. Like, just how big of a problem is that, right? For 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 whatever event that you're planning to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because you, you have people like... Cases. Sorry, Dave, go Yeah, you have people saying, like, you know, for example, Gary Vaynerchuk saying, everything will pretty much be an NFT in the future, like Turing's ticket idea, uh, every everything like buying buying real estate, 
maybe not NFTs, but but certificates and, and, and things like that will all be NFT related in the future. How, how much of, of that do you think could be potentially true? Or are there higher, use, as you're implying, are there higher use cases for NFTs? Are they yeah. more deserving of no. higher level stuff? Uh, <laughs> well, again, okay. yeah, because it must solve a problem, right? Like, for example, I, I think uh, one of the, the use case that was quite um, powerful, right, in this case is the... Let's say you want to get a degree, right? Today, um, and you want to present that degree to a potential employer um, based overseas. He has never heard of your new university. He he can't verify whether this particular degree is important or uh, it's real or not. And this, you know, becomes much more pressing in the in the space where you require a professional certification, like 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 engineers or doctors uh, like, or yeah. and stuff like that, right? So what they do is they call up, right? So again. I think uh, from a business perspective, these are man hours, right? They have to call the university. The university have to take three days to check and verify whether this particular person exists in their database um, and to provide that authentication. And that this back and forth, right? It's it's actually uh, quite quite ridiculous. Like, it's quite painful. Like. And if you want to get a notarized version of your degree, then you, you go through the entire hassle of going, going to your new... In the scenario where you lose it, you have to go through the entire hassle of going to your university, wait three days, pay a sum of money for them to process it administratively, print it out, get someone to sign it, notarize it, and then you, know, you have that authentic piece of uh, certification. But if it's on... If it's an NFT that is, uh, you know, registered or verified by the blockchain, right? That then it's easy to authenticate whether this exists or not. Yeah, or that it so, is so, real or not, right? Tony, you're in trouble then because all of your criminal history, all of your <laughs> fake identification is this is going to be. But who will govern all of this though? Like, how? How do you even like? Who would? Yeah, who would govern all of this? The community, man. Who would? Uh, yeah, it could be the community. It uh, by and large, uh, who would govern all of this? Um, because okay. if I had, you know, criminal history records or, or my educational yeah. history, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so governing this. Okay, the reason why I kind of stumbled on that uh, was because uh, the verifying of this is is by the miners, by the blockchain uh, participants, the ecosystem, right? Um, like like your miners that that help to keep the the state of the blockchain in check, right? Um, how do we proof that it's authentic is by who created or minted this particular certificate or, or this particular information, the provenance of it, right? If it's authenticated by a wallet that has been, let's say, for example, in Singapore, it's GovTech, right? Or, or MOH or whatever, right? right? This wallet, wallet is verified uh, and it's, it's authentic. Like, it's their wallet yeah. and they mint it and they you are able to trace the provenance of it, then you know that it's authentic, yeah. Uh, and not someone else just randomly submit from uh, through another means, right? And say this guy is a criminal, right? You verify and check. Hey, this is not a, this, the provenance of yeah. this is some random rando person trying to sabotage me. That could be one yeah. way to solve it. But again, there are many many other creative ways to solve it as well. Um, yeah, and that is just on the spot, right? I'm trying to think of how you might want to solve that or tackle that issue. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, so um, I mean, the more and more I think about it, right, the the our understanding of what it is actually is kind of the the issue here because we're we're looking at it from a perspective of uh, there's a fundamental misunderstanding on what type of whether what how we look at it as a technology, whether we look at it as a singular versus you know it's just the underlying tech that what it is. Um, I saw a very interesting. Um, I, I I listened to a very interesting interview recently where they said. Um, NFTs uh, are similar to, for example, like the start of the internet, because people call the internet like a big scam, right? Things like sharing information, yeah. or it's it's kind of useless, and uh, because they also said that it's you see a lot of failures, a lot of people running scams on the internet. They were blaming the internet versus blaming the people. So NFTs by itself yeah. aren't a scam. It's the it's how you use it that yeah. matters, and that's kind yes. of that's kind of my that's kind of my question that I, I'm coming to because. Um, the interesting thing that they mentioned there was what they call an NFT winter, which is similar to what happened at the start of the the, the internet, where there was a huge okay. surge in interest and then there was a massive drop uh, where people were basically, everything that was internet related kind of just went down uh, downhill, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Are we likely to experience 
something like that or like what what is uh phrase as an nft winter um i guess i i think uh like understanding the root cause of this particular winter as you mentioned it i think helps right frame things mm -hmm. yeah so why why would there be a initial spike in interest it was not because people understood the technology behind it it was because of the the spotlight was shone on many people making a lot of money from it yeah so the mentality coming into buying a particular nft was to make money right when that stops right when the, when the musical chair stops right for that then people's interest will naturally taper off until they found or until they are better educated in what it can bring and then and, and the true value of NFT, not just in its ability to appreciate in price, um, but the true value of it, the true utilization, uh, utility of it, right? And then the interest can go back up again. So I, I think that might happen as well because the initial thinking of coming into uh, why I should be into NFT is really, you know, what's the outside? What's the upside here? What's the alpha? I'm coming in from an investment perspective to buy it. I don't really understand the utility of it. I don't really understand the technology behind it. Uh, it's just, you know, my friend says that he made $2,000 from it. I'm going to try, right? So so naturally, if you stop making money, you know, interest dies off because that is your starting point, right? That's where you, that's what sparked your interest. Yeah. But Speaking of investment. Oh, sorry, Dave. Go oh, sorry, you go first, man. No, so I just got a really yeah. short follow-up question to that. So, like, you, mm -hmm. so you think that there's going to be a similar trajectory in that sense? Like, based on based, I mean, based on your understanding of what's going right. So obviously, you can't predict the future, but it's more about. Mm -hmm. Um, you think there's going to be like a downturn, and then then eventually, as the more sophisticated uh, investors, at least in this space, start coming back in, you'll start you'll start to mm -hmm. see the the gradual growth, and then you know, because you usually for transformational tech there is usually a, mm -hmm. a steep rise and then a fall because people just misuse yep. the tech as much as possible. Right. So yes, I, yes. I, you I, think I, that might happen? Yeah. That, that I, I think, I think <laughs> surely my own thoughts, right. Uh, I think yep. that might happen um, simply because mm -hmm. uh, when you lose money, you get smarter. Right. So, like uh, when I come in, I don't have to to learn anything about I, technology. I, I, I can't agree with hey, that. I've wow. lost, I've lost so much money. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got smart. <laughs> I know Dave's lost but a lot you, of money you tend too. To be more careful. Yeah, you tend to be more careful. You tend to want yeah. to understand a little bit more about why why you lose that money and why some made money and why some didn't, right? So you come into this. If there's a new wave of uh, NFT that you know um, starts to improve, you start to ask deeper questions. You start to ask questions like. Why is it this? Why what's the utility of this NFT? Why is it worth buying? How will how will value be accrued at the price of the NFT so much so that it can you know appreciate over time? You become smarter. The projects mm -hmm. that you pick becomes better, and naturally weeding out the rug pulls and the scams, right? So yeah. uh, that that is a natural process of uh, adoption, I guess. Yeah. So the only reason of... why rug pull happens is because people don't really understand or, or cannot truly verify uh, what this person is trying to sell, right? They're just coming in because of FOMO, like the fear of missing out because their friends told yeah. them to, right? And then once they start losing money, they become smarter and they start to do their own due diligence and you weed out all the scams by yourself, yeah. It's kind of like the gold rush and as Tung said, the, the dot com brush and, and like there was a period where everyone believed that as long as you start an app you'll become rich <laughs> i think maybe you were affected by that yes i was well, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah so, um we went through the I app definitely was, yeah yeah i went yeah. <laughs> yeah and even the, there was a point where people said just start a facebook page and you'll you'll become successful maybe yeah, now, yeah. no no one's even thinking about facebook but uh speaking of investment right Obviously, there's a disclaimer here saying that whatever you're going to say is for entertainment purposes only. But let's say hypothetically, and obviously entertainment purposes only, what do you think? I have three levels of people, but first level person, like let's say an entry level person, passive investor, what do you think they should invest in? Like someone like me who doesn't have much time to really go into it, but would like to passively invest in, in a bit of crypto, a bit of or NFT or blockchain, what do you think they should start looking at? Um, I think the first thing that they need to understand is um, the utility of the NFT. Would they use it if all else fail, right? If it doesn't appreciate in price, 
uh, if it's like I mentioned the two 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 types of NFTs, right? If it's an excess one, when you buy the NFT, you ex- of course you know the bonus is if it appreciates and you sell it off and you make money from it. But if it doesn't, are you gonna use it, right? Is this yeah. Discord group that you are able to get access to, right? Is this something that you like? Is this something that you want yeah. to be part of? Is this particular social group, uh, something that you want to be part of, right? It can it generate value from there from the utility. Yeah. Right, I think that's more important uh, for now, right? At least, uh, uh because yep. you know you, you really don't know where the price might go. Right, so focus a lot more on the utility, and if it's like for a game, right? Would you play the game? Is it something that you like? Is the character interesting? Is it something that you buy even if it's not an NFT? Right, uh, yeah, consider those, and uh, if you still like it or you like the graphic, why not? Just just don't go crazy, lah. Is is there like an index version? So, for example, the sandbox, you can invest in sandbox, or you can invest in in um, oh, tip of my tongue, decentraland, yeah. decentraland, but uh, Ethereum. So Ethereum, because decentraland could use bits of Ethereum. Like, is there like a if if you want if you don't want to invest in the game particularly, is there a platform that every most pla- more, most games use, for example? That you can invest in as as a passive investor, where you don't need to do that much research. I am unfortunately I'm not very well educated in that. Okay. Like yeah, yep. um, I know Decentraland uses a couple of technology. I think Polygon L two layer yep. two technologies that reduces the, the 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 scaling problem of of Ethereum. Um, the most games use that because they need that quick finality. They need that uh, low transaction fee. They need that 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 um all that you know um, additional benefits that that layer two technologies can can bring to the table. Yep. Um. But see, you you need to understand how value is being accrued, right? Like, does all this does having all this game, um, um necessarily accrue value? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not very well educated on that. Yeah. And in terms of indexes, I don't think there is one at this moment because um, I haven't heard of it at least. I'm not very well educated. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. know Australia, they released an ETF, but that's wow. kind of different from, from a, yeah. yeah. They have a crypto ETF. I forgot what it's called. <laughs> hmm. I think I think eventually you're going to um, start to see more complicated financial products coming around that's based all like might, at the basis of crypto. It it looks that way. I mean, yes. there are there are tons of different uh, platforms out there. Um, yeah, yeah. I've I've got a I've got a quick question though. Like, um, and and Ryan, um, based based on your experience, right, and 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 the way we're seeing um, blockchain tech and like crypto and NFTs kind of grow in in Singapore and and I think broader, maybe in Southeast Asia and Asia. Uh, mm-hmm. where we I would say safely say that we're pretty far behind compared to the US. Yeah, is that a fair statement? Uh, pretty far behind in in, in what sense? In terms of in terms of in, education adoption as well as uh, even innovation in the space. We're pretty far behind US. Uh, I I wouldn't say pretty far. Yeah, I, I mean, think you just slapped Ryan in the face, turn. <laughs> uh, no, he's fixing the problem. No, no, I, he's, he's fixing the problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but I I don't think we are super far ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry, super far behind. Um, in terms of like uh adoption, right? In fact, if you look at uh, uh like the the popular games like Axie Infinity was just mm-hmm. one of Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. Um, and there is a lot. There's quite a huge amount of uh, investments that are coming into Southeast Asia projects. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the you know um, blockchain companies are actually based in Singapore as well. Um and so I won't say we are super far behind, but in terms of uh, maybe talent pool, in terms of like um trying to get more developers or engineering um support, like uh to build applications on blockchain, um we might be some ways behind. But I think that that's also about to change, lies with you know um more capital going into the education sector for blockchain, perhaps. Yeah, there is also much more significant focus um on on the APEC market, in fact. That that's at least what we are seeing. Okay, so we're you're, you're we're seeing a lot of interest. Getting... So hmm. you're seeing interest mm-hmm. grow, and 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 I think what you rightly pointed out is, that, I mean, a lot of the really like a lot of really big projects and and companies are based here. 
uh, that that have, yeah. that use blockchain. So I think that's interesting. Um, and I guess mm -hmm. okay, maybe maybe where my question was was based on was the fact that um, from a crypto standpoint and from a and maybe from a education standpoint, there seems to be there seems to be more information flow from the US and to some extent the UK compared to Asia. Like there's still, mm. the, at least the people I speak to and, and, and could be a very, very specific audience, there's, there's still a bit of, um, you know, it's, it's a, there's a growing level of in education, but it's still starting at a very low base here. Yes, I, I think that definitely Asia has some catching up to do because I think uh, a lot of the, the, the the original uh, research or a lot of research has been done um, like in, in, in US before you ever, you know, gain traction in Asia, right? So definitely we do have some catching up to do. Um, um, and yes, you're right. I think uh, that there are still a lot of like um, quality content and quality products and, you know, coming out of um, the States or, you know, the, the region there, right? Um, but I believe that APEC is actually a market that, uh, is going to be catching up really, really soon. Yeah, that's that's at least my my own personal belief, and that's what we are seeing as well. There's a lot of uh, um attention and focus. Uh, you know, a lot of blockchain companies coming into yeah. APAC, looking to expand into APAC, looking to tap on the APAC market. So yeah. If if anyone wanted to keep their pulse on, keep the finger on the pulse of of, of blockchain crypto. Are there any social media accounts you recommend people following? Can I say just follow Tribe? <laughs> yeah, yeah sure, you can. Sure, you man. Can. We'll, we'll link to that. Obviously, yeah. what, do you want what's what's the uh, what's the handle? Um, oh damn! Uh, can I, can <laughs> I <send it> to you? <laughs> this is what happens when you put Ryan on the spot. He's like, oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> what's my company name? <laughs> yeah. No worries. Uh, no, what, okay. what, we'll we'll link to it. Mm. We'll link to it in the show notes. And we'll tag you on social <laughs> as well, so don't worry. People will be able yeah, to access sure. that. And then we'll yep. we'll, we'll uh, clip that part out where you say "oh damn," and then we'll put it on. A, we'll use that as a <laughs> as a promo bit. Yeah, but I, I think uh, it's important to understand what you're trying to get off these socials, right? Because people come into blockchain or crypto um, for varying reasons. There are some that are very focused yeah. on trading. You know, there are some, there there are some uh, the accounts that focuses a lot on like like the the calls and then you know um and what are the latest potential 10xers and stuff like that like there are that that, that bunch of um, um crypto accounts you might be you might want to follow if you are interested in that stuff the price section and there there are more informative content um that are coming out to to keep up to date with what your favorite protocols you know are up to um and those i think i find it best to just follow the protocols um you know on um, Twitter account themselves. You hear it from the horse's mouth, right? Mm -hmm. um, then there are some more educational content and, and like I'm um, talking about innovation, right? I'm um, sharing about the latest innovation and that's where we kind of fit into the piece of the, the pile. Up. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. That's now that's good to have, man. We'll 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 put we'll put some of that information in in, in the show notes so that people have an easy way to access it. So you can access our show notes at cool. businessoverdrinks.com. Uh, it'll everything will be mm -hmm. uploaded there. Um, so I think we're coming close to the end, but uh, we're going to, uh, I mean, thanks for coming on, but we really like to find out maybe like what's next for Tribe? Like what, what are your plans for the uh, near future? Right. So I think uh, we, we spoke about a lot about the talent crunch, right? And that's still something, and that is a very tricky problem to solve uh, because it takes time. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of um, um, fine tuning, right? Education is never an easy market. So uh, we are focusing a lot on like um, the talent piece, like developer, focusing mm -hmm. on helping to grow the developer ecosystem in the, in, in the APEC um, with different initiatives and programs that will be coming up. So that's, that's, our, that's our focus, at least, for this year. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. And it's, sorry to jam the question in there, but is the great resignation affecting oh, thankfully, AI? No. Thankfully, okay. no. Thankfully, yeah. no. We survived it pretty yeah. well, I think. Well, that's good to know, man. Um, I mean, the Great Resignation, I think, was a little bit overblown in Southeast Asia. I think people, I just, I just want a job. So um, it, <laughs> it, it it affected segments, I think, versus the entire job market. I guess so. I found yeah. here, here in Australia, a lot more jobs are being advertised that allow work-life balance. So work from home, some days in the office, some days at home. And some are just purely work from home jobs now. Jobs mm -hmm. that I never used to see existed. So it's interesting. 
Mm. Um, so we're really big on books. Uh, so before we let you go, I was wondering, are there any like books you'd recommend that, that have positively impacted your life? Positively impacted my life. I think uh, one of my favorite books is uh, Anti-Fragile by uh, Nick, Nicholas Taleb. Tal- 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 yeah. Um, and there is also one uh, on hard things about hard things by Ben Horowitz, and there's also right one on. that I uh, personally quite like. It's it's called Algorithms to Live By. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, well, I've only heard what the hard things one, but yeah, Algorithms to Live By. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Out, I think. Uh, can I can I trouble you to re- repeat the second one, Ryan? What was this? Uh, Anti fragile. Hard things about hard things. Hard things about okay. Yeah, by Ben Horowitz. Um, and the last one is um, algorithms to live by. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, those are good, man. Those are those are those are really good um suggestions on books. Um. Okay, so a couple of things, right? So we we have a lot of entrepreneurs and and. Uh, uh, would-be entrepreneurs and interested people kind of listening to our podcast. Looking back at your career, right? Like, is there anything that you would have done differently? Would you have changed anything? Oh, uh, I have made a lot of mistakes. I think that's for sure. But would I change anything? I think the answer uh, is no, because it's the mistakes that made me who I am, kind of. So honestly, I I, really, I I thought long and hard about this question, right? But I, I, I honestly wouldn't, even if I have a time machine, I wouldn't go back to change anything because I think um, all of this uh, affected me or at least the things that I take away from all the mistakes I made were positive. Yeah. So nothing I, in particular. That I, I think I would have gone back and got all the lottery numbers as well as invested in Google and Apple stock. I think I would yeah, have done that. Yeah. Tesla as well. Tesla, I would have done that. And then, or Bitcoin, uh, maybe oh, Bitcoin. Yeah, single, I, I would, I would, have, I would have done mode. Bitcoin, but I have a horrible feeling I would have lost it. So <laughs> I just lost the key. <laughs> you, <laughs> you might be right. Yeah. yeah, you lost the, the, the it was just, I just the lose key the key because I'm like, yeah, I'm rich, and then I'll just say get drunk and lose it. So I, just, I, I maybe I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I stock is a little different. I just have it. And I'll just keep it on the trading platform and <laughs> figure it out after that. Uh, but yeah, I mean stuff like that. Uh, okay, no, that's. that's I, I would have committed less crimes. Yeah, or did you buy crypto? Did you did you buy Bitcoin, Ryan, back when it came out? I had a couple of opportunities to buy it, didn't unfortunately. Yeah. Um, if if Ryan bought crypt, if Ryan if Ryan bought Bitcoin, he wouldn't tell us. He wouldn't be here. Yeah, Ryan would be like, you know, who? who what? <laughs> I'm on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a couple of opportunities. In fact, my first experience with uh, blockchain, not Bitcoin, blockchain was um, when I was running my uh, one of the early startups, right, called Fixer. Yeah, uh, where we try to to authenticate, you know, um, spare parts of cars. Yeah, but it was mm-hmm. quite early, right? There wasn't a lot of conversation around crypto. I wish I just gone down that trajectory and eventually got into crypto really, really early, but I didn't. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're on the right track now. Yeah. Um, are there, so last question, are there, based on, you know, you've obviously, at such a young age, you have such an extensive history and, and a lot, you've, you've, you've put yourself out there a lot. Are there two major lessons, you know, that, that you can you can impart, a bit of, bit of wisdom you can impart on to, to everyone listening or watching right now? Two major wisdoms. Um, wow. So, so two important lessons you've learned in your business or in your career, yeah. You know? Okay, uh, I guess the first one is um, um, things are always messy, right? Um, nothing ever goes according to plan. Um, you, the planning just gets you to the start line, and once you cross the start line, you know you you have to react and you have to adapt accordingly. So, um, don't fall in love with your plan. Always be ready to uh to to have contingencies and to. To, to adapt accordingly, yeah. So, um, and don't beat yourself up because the things don't go according to plan because they rarely, rarely, rarely do. And and, and this is this is the reality and, and, and ever more so in startups, right? Like I plan to achieve yep. X, Y, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's one. Um, uh, number two is don't take things personally. Uh, so when when people choose to, to leave or when, when your customers choose not to buy from you or to... to, to 
you know, to to do or to have your service or use your service. Like um, when I was a uh, quite, you know, a young entrepreneur, I think I took those quite personally. I was like, oh, is it because you don't like me? Is it is it something that I've done? You know, but more often than not, is is it's not as long as you know you provide the service that you are proud of. Um, you you are you 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 do right by everyone, right? Um, and you don't do something dodgy. Um, yeah, you you, you it often it's not personal. It's just that at this point, I probably don't need it, or at this point, they have their own agenda. Everybody has their own agenda. Yeah. Oh, he said, "Don't don't act dodgy, Dave." That means that you're kind of out from everything. You can't take that advice, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh man, I, I failed you. <laughs> I failed at most things around there. Then if you can't be dodgy, man. no. But that's that definitely not not taking things personally. The thing is, as business owners, you definitely need to form that hard skin, right? Yeah. Especially when you need to sell and yeah. you need to when you need to get re- when you get rejected, you, need, you will you will get rejection. Yeah, you I, will I, definitely face it. I think maybe if I can add on one thing, based actually based on my experience, right, is the fact that I think you will take everything personally at the start, purely because if you're really passionate about something, someone saying no mm-hmm. kind of hurts you a little bit more than if they were saying no to you about anything else. So then, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, th- th- like I, I experienced that myself, right? Like running my own business and then people uh, like me approaching cli- potential clients and them saying no. After all the tears and all the crying was over, you can just like take a look back and you say like, okay, cool, like nothing happened. I still cry sometimes, but very different reasons. So um, <laughs> that's the way I look at it. You kind of learn. You don't take that person, you just take other stuff person. So that's how that's how I look at my life. <laughs> so you just you just tip it into somewhere yeah, just else. Basically, you just, just, just you move the it. emotion from there to somewhere else. <laughs> so just, I like to repress it. I like to kick it in, like just like, bury it in deep it. until. It, so it comes yeah, out every, every every year. So Dave has to go on like an explosion break somewhere, <laughs> just, just break stuff <laughs> on a board. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, hey, but Ryan, hey, thank you so much, man. These are really interesting insights. I think what a lot of people are gonna get from this, hopefully, is kind of like a better understanding of what at least the impact and the value of blockchain, and then kind of see how mm. everything kind of fits on top of that because. Like I said, everyone was always looking at it as, you know, this is like a chip, you know, it's, it's blockchain is blockchain. There's nothing else beyond it versus seeing it as kind of the, the platform for different technologies and how things are run, right? Yeah. Which is very, very interesting. And, and I like how you said it's it's just like another tool in a tool belt. It's not exactly. It's not the solution to everything, which which a lot of people are hyping about. It's yeah. it's 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 good. It solves a lot of problems, but it's it's not the only solution. It, it's part of yes. A, a, a suite it's of part solutions of the solution. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you can. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you, it's, it's it's part of your toolkit essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so we should just problem. really stop listening to people like Gary Vaynerchuk and stuff like that, who just constantly just shout out about all this stuff. Is quite <laughs> it's quite everything. I can't stand Gary Vaynerchuk. It's like constantly <laughs> But 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 we would like to have him on our show. I would love to. I mean, I'm sorry, I love Gary Vaynerchuk. But I'm saying <laughs> Simon Sinek, come on. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You want to see those guys? <laughs> uh, Leaders he lost. Leaders he lost. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, but the power uh, of why. Um, no, but Ryan, thanks, man. This is really, really, really insightful. I think this will be very useful in kind of getting us as well um, to understand what's going on and, and kind of like better. Because we talk about this a lot, like NFTs and stuff. We talk about it all the time, but I think we talk about it in the same way that you know, the average guy kind of makes a mistake about it too. We we see it as a whole versus being, like you said, a tool within within a within a tool belt of everything else. All right. All right, Dave. Any last words hey, for Ryan? Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. yeah no. Yeah, thank, it, thank you so much for having me. I, I, it's a pleasure speaking with the both of you. Yeah. No, it was a lot of fun, man. If anyone wants to follow you more of your work, obviously we'll paste the, your social media handles. Anywhere else you'd like to direct people to? No. <laughs> okay. So tribex.co yeah. is the website. T- tribe, then the letter x.co. Yeah. And, but we'll, we'll link all of that in the show notes at businessoverdrinks.com. Thanks so much, Ryan. And thanks everyone for listening in or watching in uh, today, tonight, this morning. Uh, to follow us, don't forget, we're on pretty much every platform to search business over drinks, subscribe, comment, like. It really goes a long way and it helps us bring in wonderful guests like Ryan. So thanks, everyone. And thanks once again, Ryan. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right. See ya. 